Um, well, yeah, so good morning again to everyone. Um, if I'm looking, if it feels like I'm looking down on you this morning, it's just because I'm on the stand here. I'm not used to being this much higher <laughs> than everyone else. Um, and what a year it has been. Um, we're only halfway through it now. Um, and what a year it has been. Uh, as most of us have probably even forgotten at this point, we actually started this year with uh, what we thought at that time was going to be the biggest controversy of the year. Um, uh, there was uh, the threats of war between America and Iran. That's probably not even in most of our memories at the moment. Uh, we had some of the Australia's worst bushfires in history. Uh, and after all this has happened and it's sort of blown over, we were, we were probably saying to ourselves it was a bit of a rocky start uh, to the decade. Um, but surely it can only go better from here. And um, how wrong we were. Um, we have had a worldwide pandemic, which is still um, going on in most countries much worse than it is here where we live in Australia. Uh, we've had race riots in um, many of the first world countries in the world. Um, and undoubtedly, this year has been a year filled with anxiety, anger, and suffering for many people. Um, by the grace of God, many of us in our congregation have, have made it through relatively unaffected. Um, by the grace of God, our nation and our state have made it through this relatively unaffected. But the reality is for each one of us who have made it through this relatively unaffected, there has been just as many who have had to face many tears, fears and losses. Some have had to deal with the loss of jobs or a loss of income. Others have had to face the relative threat of financial ruin. And many of us um, have had to face the threat of the loss of loved ones to this disease. This year has been marked by suffering. Um, it has been a year of pain and loss. And the media will not let us forget that either. Everywhere you turn, and everywhere you look, and everything you read, you're constantly pointed back towards all the struggle that is occurring in our world today. And apart from the big things which we see as the Black Lives Matter movement or the COVID-19 crisis, there are a million other things happening in the world and that have been happening for the last couple of years that instill anxiety. The threat of China and their military power if the US were to collapse. Um, the, the persecution of Christians in third world countries. The, the gradual demonization of Christianity in our world, the first world, the West. There are a million things every day that we see that cause us anxiety. And so this morning I want us to take our eyes off of the struggle and off of all that is happening around us and to lift them up to the glory that we will see one day. To point us again to our future hope. And that that would be our solid foundation to which we hold. And so this morning, this is for all those who have suffered during this time. Those who have faced pain. That you may have a solid foundation and a firm hope to endure through your suffering. And this doesn't mean that this morning is irrelevant to those of you and those of us who have made it through relatively unaffected. All of us will face some sort of suffering or some sort of loss in our life. That is undeniable. And at that time, when we face those things, we need a solid hope to hold on to during those times. And so this morning, I want us to look at Romans 8. And we're going to be looking at specifically verses 18 to 30. So I'll read verses 18 to 30 for us. Um, this morning's sermon is specifically focused uh, from 18 to 25. And um, next time I preach in a couple of weeks, we'll be continuing by looking at verses 26 to 30. Uh, it should be up on the screen. I, what did I do with the clicker? Because there.
So Romans 8, um, verse 18 to 30, it goes, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is, it, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. And so as I said this morning, what we'll be focusing on is specifically verses 18, um, 18 to 25, and then next time we'll be looking at verses 26 to 30. And what a remarkable statement Paul starts with in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. This is Paul's thesis statement in a sense. For all the verses that follow, this is what he is supporting. He is supporting this statement with all that is following afterwards. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to even be compared. They are not worthy to be mentioned in the same sentence of with the glory that we will see. Paul's intention is to show us and exalt in the glorious future which is ours in Jesus Christ. And he is saying that this glory is so great that even the worst suffering even the worst pain that we may face in this life is not even worthy to be mentioned in the same sentence. It is not even worthy to be had in the same thought. And how great must that glory be for Paul, a man who is well acquainted with suffering, to say that it is so great that we are not even to compare it to the suffering that we face. See what Paul is doing, he is setting before us our future hope. And in hopes that that would encourage us to endure through our time now. The thing that sort of comes to mind to me is this uh, old show on Discovery that I used to watch from now and again called Deadliest Catch. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched it, it is basically a, a documentary about men um, on these uh, fishing boats going out to fish for uh, king crab. But the oceans in which they fish are cold and um, stormy and tumultuous. And it's a, a very difficult job, very uncomfortable, and um, probably just one of the worst jobs you can imagine yourself doing. But these men are able to endure these awful conditions because of the reward which they see at the end. Because it is a well-paying job. We do not endure because we hope for some great payoff. But the reality is that our hope set before us, the, the promised reward that is to come is what empowers us to endure, empowers us to endure throughout this life. 
for the joy of our future reward we are able to endure now. And that does not mean that we endure suffering in this life uh, as a stoic would, just taking it uh, head on and just being unaffected by uh, the pain that comes with things in this life. As Christians, we are able with tears in our eyes and hurts in our hearts to fully experience all of life's struggles, but to do so with a firm foundation and a hold on our future hope. And so Paul goes on in verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself may be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Paul is exulting in the glory that will be in saying that all of creation, all of creation, everything around us, the mighty mountains, the roaring rivers, the, the great oceans, they long to see this glory revealed as well. Why does the creation long to see our glory revealed? Paul says in verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility. Um, the creation was put under a curse. As we look back to Genesis 3 in the beginning of our Bible, we see God creating man. God creates man from the dirt. He, he intimately breathes life into these creatures. And He sets them on top of creation as His um, vice regents, as those who rule with His authority on this planet. He gives them dominion over this planet. But humanity is unsatisfied with God. We want to be just like God. We fall into the temptation. And these creatures which God created from the dirt commit high treason against Him. And God being just and true to His word, pours out a curse on the heads of creation. And so the curse of sin is allowed to continue and to envelop all of creation. And so that is what it means for uh, creation to be subjected to futility. And it was not done so willingly but by God, but God subjecting creation to futility does so in hope. God does so looking forward to the future, knowing that He would send His Son, and that through Christ all of creation would be redeemed and made new. And so verse 21 he has subjected in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption. See, as in Adam, the whole creation was subjected to futility and, and, and to bondage and corruption. So now in Christ, when He comes again and all that He accomplished on the cross is realized and we are raised and glorified, so all creation with us too will be encapsulated and captured in this glory that will be revealed. So this glory which we are, are, are expecting in verse 18, that is not just us being raised, but it is the whole creation being made new. This glory extends far further than our personal selves, but to all of creation. And in verse 22, Paul again says, For we know that the whole creation groans together in pains of childbirth. Repeating what he said in verse 19. See, this idea of the pains of childbirth is pain and suffering which culminates and finishes in joy. It is not pain which is an end in itself, but it is a pain which finds its fulfillment in a joy which so transcends and is so much greater than the pain itself. If you were to ask any mother, the nine months of uncomfortableness and the pain of childbirth, is it not completely eclipsed by the joy of the child? And so this is the analogy which Paul is making. All of creation is like a mother giving birth, groaning in pains and suffering. But this pain and suffering in the end leads to a joy which so completely overshadows the pain. 
And verse 23, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. It is not only creation which groans, it is us who groan. And that is because we have tasted of the first fruit of the Spirit. Through the Spirit living in us, we have tasted something of what it is to live in sinless perfection. We have not fully tasted, we have not fully have, we do not fully have it yet, but we have tasted something of the sweetness of it. Through the Spirit of God, we have tasted something of full communion with God. We have had a sweet taste. Through the Spirit, we have had, through the Spirit living in our community, we have tasted something of what it will be to live in a new creation with a glorified humanity. See, through the Spirit, our lips have touched some of the glory that is to be ours. And having tasted that, we cannot do otherwise than groan and wait for the full realization of these things. See, uh, when I think about it, I think about it in the, in the sense of, um, do anyone remember chappies or, or, or bubble gum? And so, so you taste it and you chew it and it is so sweet, but it, is, it, it doesn't satisfy. There, there is something that you, you want to be able to swallow. You want to be able to eat the full meal. You do not just want the taste. And you groan for the full fulfillment of being able to eat this sweet thing. And that is the spirit in us. We have tasted the sweetness. And having tasted that sweetness, we cannot but want to see the fullness of that. And so we groan inwardly longing for when Christ would come again. Oh, what a glorious thing to live without sin, to never have to struggle with temptation. Oh, how glorious will be in that day when we are able to live with one another and no, have no fear of death, have no pain, have no illness. The glory of having full relationship with God and living with Him in redeemed bodies on a new earth. That is the glory that is being revealed. That is the glory that is to be revealed. And see, the suffering that we face then in this life, it is not pointless or an end in itself, but it is what we endure for the moment with our eyes on future glory. And now we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and how He has endured, how He endured suffering greater than any of us could ever imagine, for the glory and the joy set before Him. In Hebrews 12, from verse 1, we read, therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. See him in the garden, see him sweating great drops of blood, hear his words, let this cup pass from me, hear him say, Father your will be done, see him on the cross, see the man bloody and dying, the image of suffering itself, hear his words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endured suffering. Suffering greater than any of us could ever imagine. Not only suffering physical pain, but suffering the pain of 
the wrath of God being poured out upon him. And he, how does he endure this? He endures it by looking forward to the joy set before him. And so let us look to the author and perfecter of our faith as we endure suffering in any times of life. Let us look to Him and let us look to our future joy, our future joy in glorification that will so transcend the pains and sufferings of this world that they are not even worthy to be mentioned. Let us not be discouraged by pain. But may it drive us more and more to hold on tightly to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. To the hope of a glorious future that we have in Him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank You. We thank You for all that You have done. We thank you that you have assured us of a glorious future. You have promised us joy so much greater than all pain and suffering we can imagine in this life, no matter how great. We pray that you may give us peace to endure throughout these difficult times. Father, I pray for us who have made it through easily that you would give us compassion for those who have not. That we may love them well. Lord, I pray that we may always hold on to your glorious promises as all of us go through hard times. In Jesus' name, I pray that we would glorify you in the good times and in the bad. In Jesus' name, amen.